Hey, it's question and answer time with Chris. So how are you doing, Chris? Oh man, I'm doing good. Great, well, let's get into these questions. I really enjoy doing this. It's a lot of fun. I hope that we're helping people, Todd. Yeah. Because that's, that's the goal. The goal is to try to give answers that give people some insight, especially into the core values of the way the kingdom thinks. That's great, cool. All right, well, our first question, uh, yeah. she wants to re remain anonymous. Okay, great. But I think it's a, a question that really will help a lot of people out there. Okay. So she read your book mm -hmm. and she's someone that... That's a good book, by the way. The first book. Yeah, the first book's a great Ways book. Ways of Royalty, I yeah. agree. It was an awesome book. And she really uh, got a lot out of it, especially in terms of uh, thinking about how she is as a friend. And she's come from a hard background, and she says that she's not been able to really make and keep friends. Okay. She doesn't know how. She said recently uh, a, a leader in her life was recommending, you know, it's really important that you make some friends and <clears throat> friends that you can keep for a long period Whoa. of time. So she's just saying she doesn't know how to do that. Um, she doesn't know how to develop friendships. Can you offer any insight, any wisdom on how to do that? But, you know, first of all, I think that being a friend just simply means that you're, you know, Philippians 2 says that you're more interested in other people's lives than you are your own. Right. And so I think that, you know, w one of the things that happens is, is that we get so self-aware, you know, we get so self-conscious. And what happens when you're self-conscious, I don't mean this harshly, but sometimes self-consciousness is just selfishness, isn't it? I become so right. self-conscious that I don't become you conscious. Mm. And Jesus, you know, he was, he was, he's, he told us to pray, our Father, give us our daily bread, yeah. forgive us our debts. And so Jesus, the kingdom mindset, Jesus taught us the kingdom mindset, and the kingdom mindset, mindset is to think corporately, mm. to think our Father. And what I'm getting at is this, Todd. Most of friendship is, is simply thinking of others more importantly than I think of myself, Philippians 2. Right. It's living outside of my little world and saying, okay, well, how, how can I bring out the best in you? Mm. And being a friend of somebody is simply like thinking about how can I bring out, how can I bring out the best in other people? Yeah. You know, um, uh, so somebody, somebody once said uh, that you know that there are people that you're they bring joy wherever they go, and there are people that they bring joy whenever they go. <laughs> huh? You know, and the the goal is to bring joy <laughs> wherever you go. That's funny. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> that good. was a little belated. I know. Laugh there. Come on. Yes. Yeah, so the, the 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 goal is to be a kind of person that when I come into the room that I draw out the best in you, that I, I'm, I'm looking outside of myself to see how I can actually benefit your life. Right. But one of the struggles is, is that when, like, you know, I don't know who this person is, of course, but one of the struggles is, is that once we kind of are aware that we don't build friends, we become very self-conscious, you know, and that actually moves us in the wrong direction because it's like, oh, what's wrong with me? Something's wrong with me, people don't like me, uh, mm -hmm. I'm dysfunctional. And the problem here is, is that I'm again I'm thinking about myself, and to build friends I have to think outside of myself. Right. So sometimes just being over aware that I don't make friends easily can lead me to actually develop more of a problem by being too self conscious. Totally. I don't think being friends with people is that hard. It's, it's basically just finding somebody that you can connect with and serving them. Hmm loving them and um, laying down your life for them. So it's almost just as simple as, like you said in the beginning, it's just mm -hmm. focusing on someone else, considering them more important yeah. than yourself, just like a decision you make. Is it that simple? I think it is. And the second thing is being, being unoffendable. Mm -hmm. Like some people don't make friends because they're offended by everyone. You know, somebody, you know, I remember just not too long ago, I walked by somebody and I think it was in church and they came up to me about them two months later and they said, you really hurt my feelings. I said, what did I do? I said, you walked past me and I said, hi, and you didn't say anything to me. And you know, and then I walked by you about a week later, you didn't smile. And I'm like, okay, I never heard you say hi to me. And sometimes I'm really focused. Right. Um, I'm thinking about something I'm gonna do. I'm really sorry, well, I was really offended. It's like, 
Well, you know, if you're really sensitive, like you're easily offended, it's going to be tough to make friends because friendships require you to open up your heart. Right. You can't make friends with all your armor on. That's good. You've got to take your armor off. I mean, in order to have a heart-to-heart -heart connection, I mean, there are places to wear your armor, like Ephesians 6 talks about, putting on the full armor of God. Mm. I mean, this is a dangerous world, Todd, and, and there's a place to wear your armor. But there, but there needs to be a place where you can take your armor off and have intimacy with the body. And if you refuse to do that, you never build friendships because it's kind of, you know, you got a, a clanging symbol. There's that noise, you know, it's like armor to armor. You know, right. it's like, eh, no, that's not going to work. Mm. So there are times to take all that armor off and make yourself vulnerable. Well, if you've been hurt a lot in your life and you choose to leave your armor on, that same armor that keeps the arrows out of your heart also keeps love out of your heart. So wow, that's good. you can't wear that armor everywhere. Right. There's got to be a time when you take it off. That's really Become good. vulnerable. Let people see who you really are. Let them understand who you are. And just as importantly, you getting to know who they really are and allowing people to make mistakes in your life without you putting the armor back on. Yeah. There are no perfect people except for Jesus, you know. Right. That's good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Our next question is from Chris. That's and a good name right there. It is a cool name. I thought you'd like that. And he says that he knows your life has been lifted out of some extraordinary hardships and you're now enjoying some of the fruit of your faithfulness to God through those hardships. I've also heard you say something along the lines of, hey, just because it took me 20 years, if it only takes you two, then good for you. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of the hardships you have faced in your life might be considered necessary for you to have gone through in order to have been entrusted with the role you now fill today. But conversely, how much might have been unnecessary because you missed God's leading. So the question he's asking is, <laughs> are there any lessons we could learn from you to ensure that we make the most of the wilderness experience while giving it a chance to be 40 days instead of 40 years? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes great sense. Okay. And I was just thinking about the answer as you're, you know, asking the question. You know, I, I'm just thinking about my own life. It's like, you know, there are trials, James 1. Consider all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Yeah. So there are trials that, that you can't get around. Like, he, he made a really, really great point, because between the promise and the palace is always the process. Right. And that process gets you ready to stay in the palace. That's good. You know, King Saul figured out a way around the process. He, I don't even know that it was his fault, actually. The people asked for a king out of time. Mm -hmm. And he was a king out of time. Yeah. And so, you know, he didn't go through the process that kings go through to become king. You know, he didn't go through a process because, because he didn't get it. Because the people asked for a king, God was developing a king. But it was King David. Of course, David wasn't even born yet. But the point is, is that I think that there's, I think there are ways to get around the process, and you can't stay in the palace, so to speak. Right. And um, and that's a bummer. But there's also ways that you lengthen the process. And he gives a great example. I think it's an example that I have taught too. Is that uh, it was 40 days journey about from the from Egypt to the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. It took them 40 years. Right. So you can, ex I don't think you can shorten the process. Like I think if it's 40 days, if it's two years, if it's five years, God says, listen, you know, the greater the destination, the longer the gestation. Yeah. So if God says, listen, this is a, a five year journey. I don't think you can make it, you know, four years and 11 months. Right. But I, I don't think you should. But I think that you can make it 25 years. Right. Yeah. So how do you do that? I think that you I think that you you extend the length of the process by not staying tender in your heart, mm. not staying connected to God, not being quick to repent when you make mistakes in the process. In other words, what extends the process? What extends the process in Israel's life? They didn't get it. I mean, they never got out of kindergarten. They kept taking the same test over and over and over and they never passed test 1. Right which was, will you trust God with your life? Mm. So, you know, first they get out there and they, and they run out of food and they go, oh, God's trying to kill us and God provides manna. And then they're like, well, we have no water. God's trying to kill us and God provides water. And then they're like, well, there's no meat, so God's trying to kill us. And they're like, well, here's meat. And it's like, they never got it. I mean, for 40 years, they're complaining. Right. 
And God's all, listen, I brought you out here to grow you, not to destroy you. I delivered you from... And they never got less than one. God is good, hmm. and, he's, and he brought you out here to bless you. They right. never got that. So, you know, in my own life, it's like, how many times have I slowed the process down where every time I don't get that God loves me, he cares about me, and everything he does, he does for my good. Hmm. So when I start doing like, oh, God brought me out here to destroy me, God's punishing me, God, I'm like, okay, we get to go through this test again. Right. And what's really cool, Todd, is you really can't flunk one of God's <laughs> tests. You right. just keep taking it over and over until you get it. Yeah. You know, and you may not ever, see, God doesn't promote you because you're older. Right. I mean, you may be, you know, you may be in kindergarten at the age of 45 in God's world. Right. Because you're not going to, he's not going to allow you to go around the process as long as you stay in him. Okay. So I think that, I think heart attitudes are the key though. But I can tell you like, this may be overly simple, but it's so important that we have accountability in our life. Because I think that it's very difficult to see when you are hmm. circumventing the process or causing the process to be long. It's so hard to see it in your own life. You know yourself in your own life. It's like I, you, you have a hard time figuring out what, what you're doing wrong and right. Right. But other people can see it real easily. Hmm. But you can see in other people's life stuff there. And like, you're like, well, that was really dumb. Yeah. So it's, like, it's kind of like the God, God um, he developed the body in a way that we need each other. Right. So one of the things I would say is that I'm not always sure how I'm circumventing the process in my life. But when I'm accountable to people, I get really good feedback from them about the fact that I am prolonging the process or circumventing the process because I've got the wrong heart attitude. Right. So I, I think having people in our life is that, that actually have permission, I mean, let me put it differently, having wise people in our life right. who actually have permission to speak into our lives helps us to make sure that we don't turn the 40 days into 40 years. That's really good. Yeah. Has that been a big part of your journey? I have people? seven guys that I'm accountable to. I meet with them twice a week when I'm home. Wow. We have brutal discussions at times. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. It's that, that whole thing about the last question. You know, it's like learning to be unoffendable. Right. Sometimes you know you get your feelings hurt, and I'm like, you know, that really hurt. Ow, you know. Mm. Um, sometimes the truth does hurt. I'm not talking about you know telling people bad stuff or beating somebody with the Bible. But I mean, sometimes when somebody tells us something that's really a big issue in our life, it hurts. Yeah. But think about what the ramifications are not having people like that. Right. You know, it could be forty years. It could be the forty years. 40 yeah. Days. So you know, I interact with these guys all the time. Um, they have authority in my life. I've given them that authority in my life. I've I've given them permission to talk to me. Um, the other thing is when they tell me hard things, I don't punish them for it. That's I good. just punish them does uh, mean, you know uh, can look like oh, I yell at you or I, I argue with you but it can also mean that it's like okay you hurt my feelings I'm not talking to you anymore right. this shut down it's like I'll let I'll I'll show you what it's like to try to correct me right so you know uh, I go hey ah that hurt you know it's like you know thank you for talking to me maybe we don't even agree you know mm. sometimes when you're in accountable relationships doesn't mean that people are always right. Right. Sometimes they're not always right. You know, sometimes they're like, they're not right. But man, I'd rather have those few times that they're wrong. I'd rather have them feel free to speak into my life at the risk of them being wrong, as opposed to punishing them just because they're wrong right. and shutting down that culture in my life. Yeah. So that can be really painful, though. Uh, it's part of the process. Totally. Have you ever had that in your life? A bit, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel so good. It doesn't feel so good at first. That's what Hebrews 12 says, though. Hmm. What's it say? It says that discipline doesn't seem good at first. Right. It is not fun at first, I mean, you know, but it, at, in the end, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now you have a, a quote that's really been helpful to me. You said that vision gives pain a purpose. Yeah. So, how important do you think it, has, it is to have a vision of the palace to help you get through the process? I think it's amazingly important. And I think that a lot of people get a vision, like they have an encounter with God, whatever. But they don't keep it in front of them. Right. They don't keep it in front of them. They forget the vision. 
you know, the uh, sons of Issachar. It's no, um, um, I, the, uh, I'm, I'm messing up the quote. The sons of Ephraim forgot the works of God, and and they failed. Hmm. The sons of Ephraim forgot the works of God, and they fell in battle. I mean, it's so important that we remember, you know, the works of God, the 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 seasons of miracles of, of God, the 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 prophetic declarations over us. You know, they used to stack rocks up right. when they would have an encounter with God. They'd build an altar. It was an altar of remembrance. It was like. You know, it was a place that I, it's kind of a conversation piece. I walk by that stack of rocks every day and I'm, oh, that's where God met me. Oh, this is what he said to me there. And, you know, the greater the pain, the more clear the promise needs to be. You know, the greater the, the pain I'm walking through, the more clear the promise needs to be. You know that in your own life. I mean, totally. if you got a promise, you know, and you're in the middle of pain, you're like, yeah, this all makes sense. I'm going to press through this. It's going to work. Yeah. But if I have no vision... Then, you know, I either try, if I have no vision, then I either try to stay out of pain or I try to find pleasure. Wow. And that's just no, I mean, pleasure's great, staying out of pain's fine. That's just no way to live your life. Right. You know, what'd you do today? Well, I didn't have any pain. You know, it's just like, what were you born to do? You know, I was born to change the world. I wasn't born to, like, find pleasure or stay out of pain. I find pleasure on, in the midst of what I'm called to do. But I don't make pleasure the, the purpose of my life and let it be the fruit of my life. That's really good. Yeah. Awesome. So vision's huge. It is. Yeah. That's really huge. Cool. Very good. That's good. Okay. Let's get to our very last question okay. for today. Here we go. Last question. Bill asked, um, well, he said, I have heard you and Bill Johnson say that you have to pray from heaven to earth. What does that mean and how do you do it? Okay. Well, what I've been saying is that not only should we pray from heaven to earth, but that we should live from heaven to earth. Right. First of all, let me say this. When you're living from earth to heaven, you're living defensively. Right. Your, your, your whole prayer life is controlled by what is instead of what should be. Hmm. And you're looking at the circumstance. You're looking at the newspaper. You're, 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 you're always praying, this person needs to be healed. That person needs to be... And of course, we need that, right? We need, we need circumstances that are wrong to be altered by God. Right. Of course we do. But when my whole prayer life is reactive... Instead, reacting to what was, what is, as opposed to responding to what should be. Mm. But when I'm sitting in when I'm sitting in heavenly places, what's happening is I'm praying the will of God. I'm not just praying. I'm not just praying to God. I'm praying with God. Right. I'm hearing the voice of God. I'm sitting with with God. I'm I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. Right. And because I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. I'm seeing things from eternity, hmm. and I'm calling things that are not as though they are. Are you right. with me? Yep. I'm beginning to I'm say, okay, this nation is to be whatever. Let's say, you know, America. One thing is, America, America, this is true. America is to be an apostolic nation hmm. that sends missionaries to all parts of the world to transform the culture of the kingdom. And, I be, and I'm sitting in heavenly places, and I'm not just, you know, praying about the the problem in you know that we're having in you know New Orleans or whatever, and those are important. Right. But when I'm praying from heaven towards earth, I'm also praying apostolic prayers, and apostolic prayers as I'm praying the mission of heaven down to earth. Wow. Do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. I am praying for the will of what's what's in heaven. I'm praying that what is in heaven comes to earth. Right. Does well, that make sense? Totally. And I'm thinking this is connected to something we've talked about before as far as slaves versus friends. Yes. Because it's really the friends that can even know what's happening to that's pray right. from heaven to earth. Is that a connection? That's I think it is. You know, I think that when we, when we get saved, oftentimes we're so aware of the, the earth. You know, we're so aware of what's happening on the earth. You know, we're, I like to think of it like this. We're like a caterpillar. Right. And, you know, but the goal is to make a metamorphosis, you know, to go through a metamorphosis so that we become a butterfly and that we're looking, f we have a totally different perspective. That's good. And I think that, I think the whole church is going through a metamorphosis right now. I think that, I think we're, you know, I think we're accustomed to praying from earth towards heaven. We're accustomed to reminding God of all the problems of the world. And, and that is important. I don't want to ever lose sight of that. You know, I don't want to ever lose sight of, you know, I don't want to ever be like, 
so heaven, you know, heavenly minded that I lose touch with the heart of people who are broken. Yeah. But it's important. So it's important that I have. I'm aware of the hearts of people who are broken. Aware of the cries of people who are hurting. But it's even more important that I'm aware of what the cries of heaven. Mm. Like, what is heaven saying? What does God want to do? What does it look like up here? Because my model for earth is heaven. Right. My model for earth isn't a reaction to what's wrong. Mm. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? Totally. I'm not, I'm not praying in reaction to what's wrong when I'm in, seated in heavenly places. I'm praying in response to what I see in heaven. I'm praying what's in heaven to earth. Yeah. So, and I know that I know that there's a tension, you know, a, a positive tension that we need to be, you know, we need to be also have our feet uh, connected to what's happening on earth. Now, you're not saying that people actually need to be taken physically to heaven oh, no, and no. see things and bring it to earth. You're, there's some way that how, how does that work for just in a daily basis praying heaven to earth? Well, I think it's, you know, maybe it's be said this way, just having the mind of Christ. It's like, um, you know, Bill used to say this all the time. He said, if you have 30 minutes to pray, spend 25 minutes worshiping and five minutes praying. Because mm -hmm. when you pray after you've worshiped for five, for, if you pray after you've worshiped for 25 minutes, you'll have heaven's perspective and you'll be praying prayers that God really wants to answer. That's cool. That's really practical. Yeah, so it's really practical. And, you know, if you, if you have 10 minutes, you know, it takes seven minutes to, to, to worship and three minutes to pray. See, the, the deal is, Todd, and we all know this, God already knows what needs to be done. Right. So it's not like, okay, let's think up some things. And not only does he know, he wants to do it. Hmm. So sometimes prayer is more like complaining to God. Yeah. It's like, you know, I've got to convince him now. This, uh, the, there's this problem over here with my, with my friend, and, uh, you know, God probably doesn't really want to do it. I better really stir him up. And, and so I say the same thing 18 times. Oh, Lord, Lord, help my friend. Oh, Lord, please help my friend. Oh, God, help my friend. Jesus said, you think you're going to be heard because you talk a lot. Mm. You pray long. You repeat things a lot. And it says to the Father, you know, uh, I said I'd answer that. Mm. So sometimes we have longer prayers, not because we're so profound, but just because we're not convinced that God wants to answer. Right. So I, I, think, I think it's just having the heart of God having the mind of Christ, uh, sitting in heavenly places, um, to me means that I, I'm getting the mind of Christ. I'm like, Holy Spirit, um, what is it do you want to do over the land? Holy Spirit, I have some things I want to talk to you about. Mm. I see this and this and this that need to change. But I want your perspective. Like, what is? What are you emphasizing? What are you yelling? What are? You, what's the bold print on mm. in heaven? Yeah. And I find that when I'm praying like that, I'm praying things I would have never thought about praying. Because the Holy totally. Spirit's not worried. You right. know, he doesn't worry. He's not like, well, this is going bad in Afghanistan. Or neither. He doesn't worry. He doesn't, he doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't pray like that. Right. So what happens when you, leave, when you let worry out of your prayer life? Like you kick it out of your prayer life. You let fear out of your prayer life. Change your prayer life. Yeah. Praying from faith instead of fear. Totally. So this is, I mean, you need to have a real relationship with God mm -hmm. to pray this way. You need totally. to be hearing from God. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Cool. Well, great thanks, question. Chris. It's been great again. Have yeah. this time with you. I really love it doing this. Thank you, Todd. Great. Bless you. Okay.